Isn't this a wonderful day to praise and, and glorify Jesus? Isn't this a great time together? Uh, glad that you are here. I want to add my welcome to those of you that are visiting. And uh, We want you to be aware of a program we do each Sunday during the sermon period for children ages 3 to the 3rd grade. We provide a class that they will enjoy, and if they want to start making their way on up here, there'll be a a song that we're going to sing, and then they'll be dismissed to that class and have a marvelous time together. Marking your song book, if you will, song number 940. Number 940, which will serve as a song of invitation. Have the morning lesson, number 940. And then before the lesson, turn with me to the song number 810. Number 810. the outset of the lesson, I want to tell you how grateful I am, brethren, that the church here is involved with encouraging me to my work with Africa, with Sunset International Bible Institute. I'm grateful to be working with that. And especially this morning, I, I want to say thank you to Emmanuel uh, for his uh, encouragement to us in the Bible class. Uh, Emmanuel is, is just a prime example of why I'm engaged in this work in Africa. And the school that he has uh, there is a shining example of why Sunset's involved with those schools in Africa. And, and uh, so I'm grateful to be a part of your work, brother. And he has his son with him, uh, Favor. Why don't both of you stand up? Because there are people here right now that didn't get a chance to see your class. This is Emmanuel and his son, Favor. Both from uh, Akadison, Nigeria, Africa. Grateful to have you here, brother. Grateful to have you here. We're in the midst of a series on uh, the epistles of Peter. The focus of those epistles is, in, is preparing the brethren 
to, to deal with the suffering and the hard times that they would have to deal with as Christians in the church of the first century. We've already looked at 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9, where he spoke to them about, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, that you may show the excellencies of him that called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. He says, once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. That is so precious in the face of hard times. Brethren, you're special. You're very special. When the Bible says, and as I spoke in my last sermon, uh, Sunday before last, um, that us being both chosen, uh, we are also sojourners, and we are also the sanctified. And there is such an echo going on that maybe we can turn the volume down a little bit. Because sometimes I get loud. <laughs> Amen. Yeah, I heard that. <laughs> But all of that is to say, Peter starts his epistle out by saying, you are very special. God chose you out of the world. And that God has made you to be sojourners because this, this world's not your home. And so whatever difficulties you have here, it's okay because we have another place we're going to in which there'll be no troubles or hard times. And then also he makes the case that you and I are sanctified, again pointing out how special we are set apart by God. But I want to focus again on the subject of us being a chosen race. I think that's such a, a precious concept that God wants you. That's what the word chosen means. You go to the grocery store and you choose which brand of beans you want. You go to the store, not that I'm wanting to compare you to beans, you're much more than beans, but, but we, we, we go to a car lot, we pick out the car we want. It's chosen, that's the one we choose. You people are chosen among all the people of the world have been given this precious opportunity. I want to spend some time with you today in explaining why God chose you. The psalmist David wrote in Psalm 139, in verse 23, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. For sure as the world, brethren, God does. He searches your heart. And he does know your thoughts. The psalmist said, beginning there in verse 1 of that psalm, O Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You know when I am uh, sitting down. You know when I am rising up. You know my thoughts from afar. You search and, uh, you search and out my path. And by, on my lying down and my rising up, you are acquainted with, with all my ways. Even before a word is in my mouth, he says, on my tongue, Oh, Lord, you know it. He just knows you so much. And he's so glad to have you as his child. He goes on to say in verse 13, For you formed my inward parts, and you knitted me together in my mother's womb. You said God was involved with you before you were even born. It's one of the reasons why abortion is such an atrocity. Because it's God that places that infant within the womb. And it is He that is putting together all the organs, knitting together all the parts of that infant's body. That is God's workmanship. And He has a plan for that workmanship. That baby that's forming in the womb at the hand of God. Notice verse 16. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. And in your book, and here's where I'm going here, and in your book all the days of my life were planned for me and were written Every word of them, or every one of them, the days that were formed for me before as yet I was born. You see, you're not just chosen. You're someone who God placed within the womb of your mother, formed you together to be the person you are, so that one day you could be sitting here at this moment, in this place, being the child of God so precious in His sight. You, my friends, are the creation of God and created with a purpose. You were created by a purpose and with a purpose, and that is going to be the focus of today's lesson. What did God see about you in the future that He should so much want you? Well, God looks on the heart. The song we just sang a few moments ago, that sometimes words fail us, but Lord, You know every thought, You know every word, 
So listen to our hearts. That is my message today, brethren. Let God listen to your heart. Because that is how He chose you. Just as He chose David in 1 Samuel chapter 16 and verse 7, the Bible says that as King David was being selected to be king, with both a plan and a destiny in mind, notice what it says was the impetus of how God knew David's my man. He says in 1 Samuel 16, as he spoke to Samuel, he said, The Lord said to Samuel, Do not look upon the, out, uh, the appearance, outward appearance or on how he is, because I have, or how tall he is, for I have chosen him, for the Lord does not uh, see the things of the way a man sees. But man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. It was what God saw within David that caused him to choose David. It wasn't what was in David's hands. It wasn't what was in his mouth. It wasn't what was uh, about his body. It was what was in his heart that caused God to know and for Samuel to realize this is going to be the king that God has chosen. God looks on the heart. He does so with you and with me as well. It is exactly how God chooses us as well. God looks on the heart. I mean, when you're choosing up a football team, you're wanting to look and see who's the biggest guy. You know, I want the big guys on my team, you know? And, and, and so I, I want uh, people that are of high stature, big power, in order for them to be on my team. Same way with basketball. You want somebody tall. You don't want somebody just necessarily large. You want somebody tall. And yet when God chooses, He chooses the heart. In gymnastics, those who are involved in the Olympic gymnastics, the world-class gymnasts, uh, they become champions because of balance and strength and self-control and self-denial. These are men with bodies that are like, like gods. Like mine. Now, wait a second. Oh, yes, I did. I'm not in that picture, but I am in this picture. That's me. I'm a senior in high school doing a handstand on the rings. No, I guess I was a junior. Yeah, that's a junior. But anyways, what is God looking for? He's not looking for the physique, the size, the stature, the beauty, the brilliance. He's looking at what? What's he looking at? The heart. He wants to see what's in the heart, not what's in your hand. And so he says he looks into his heart, not the outward strength or beauty. It's kind of like plastic eggs. We all love plastic eggs. I didn't have those when I was a kid. All we had was boiled eggs. But now they got plastic eggs that the kids can find in their Easter egg hunts. But the whole principle is, is that there's a piece of candy inside. And it's all closed up and the kids are going around looking for that candy, you know. And they find the Easter eggs, but what are they actually looking for when they're looking for them eggs? Wait, what are they actually looking for? Yeah, they're looking for the one that's got the money in it. And you can't see which one it is. Boy, they'd love to have that x-ray vision to be able to see which one that is. God looks into our heart. He knows what's on the inside. And sometimes it's pretty filthy. Sometimes it's pretty filthy. I find it ironic that it was David's heart that brought God to choosing him because it was David that sinned with Bathsheba. It was David that broke God's heart. And such a corrupt life in doing so. He even killed Uriah the Hittite in order to hide up or hide out the fact that he had betrayed his own wife and stolen Uriah's wife. Such a corrupt heart. But there was something that God saw in David in 1 Samuel 16 that he knew if the man were given a chance to repent, he would. And so David wrote some years later after repenting of what he had done and pleading with God to forgive him. Listen to the words of David in Psalm 51. It is a psalm that he penned in repentance. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Notice verse 10. And create in me a clean heart, O God, 
and a renewed right spirit within me. My friend, if you're sitting here right now, and, and because of sin in your life, you are a broken person. If you have embarrassed God and shamed God, in that He chose you to be a part of His kingdom, and yet now you have soiled that with your iniquity, know that David did so also. But it is all about your heart, my friend. Let God look into your heart and to see in your heart what He saw in David's heart as David pleaded, Lord, create in me a clean heart. And God indeed did do so and gave him that righteousness because it is the heart to which God looks. The song we sang a minute ago, how do you explain How do you describe a love that goes from east to west and runs as deep as it is wide? You know all my hopes, Lord. You know all my fears. And words cannot express the love we feel, but we long for you to hear. So, he says, listen to our hearts. Hear our spirits sing a song of praise that flows from those you have redeemed. We will use the words we know to tell you what an awesome God you are. But words are not enough to tell you of our love. So listen to our hearts. That's what He wants, my friend. He wants so much for your heart to be open and wide and given to Him. And if he will, you will allow that, He will clean you. He'll create in you a clean heart if you've ever shamed Him. But so what is God looking for when things are good in your life and you are right with God? What is God looking for inside my heart? He wants to see your capacity for love because He wants to fill you with His love. He wants to see that you're capable of kindness. He wants to know your humility, my friend, because if you do not have the humility that you need, you never be the child of God you could be. He wants a child that's obedient, so he seeks an obedient heart. He seeks a heart that's looking for him. Everything we've looked at was David crying out to God, saying, Lord, look at my heart, clean my heart, make me what you want me to be. More than anything, that's what he wants. He wants to see an honest heart within you. Not a corrupt and hypocritical heart heart that shows up on Sunday, but's a reprobate on Monday. He wants you to be consistently honest with him and yourself and who tells the truth, who does not lie to his face. So God chose those that were not so perfect. That was the case with David. That was the case with you and and with me. The Bible says He doesn't choose the beautiful, the fast, the mighty, and the strong. He doesn't choose those that have all the ability. Rather, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 that God chose the foolish and weak and lowly in the world as His people, to put to shame the wise and the strong. What the world looks at and says is repulsive, God looks at and says, that's my child right there. That's the one I love and have called. Because you see, Jesus is looking at the heart and not the outward appearance. James echoes the same thought in James 2 and verse 5, when he says, God chose those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which He has promised to those who love Him. You find the people who live in the, in the dirtiest, most run-down and, and, and broken hovel of a home, with dirt floors, and dirt streets, and their clothes are tattered. I'm telling you, that's the people that God's looking for because it has nothing to do with the style of their clothes. It has to do with the character of their heart. And so, my friend, give him an open and honest heart because that's what he chooses. That's what he chooses. You know, more often than not, when you and I choose up sides, when we choose people that we want on our side, more often than not, we, we look for that which is strong and powerful. We look for that which is, well, in a squirt gun fight, let's put it this way, in a squirt gun fight, Who are you going to choose? If we're going to have a squirt gun fight this morning, who are you going to choose? Oh, that's a good idea. 
that's a, that's a good idea, isn't it, Michael? Here, whoop, 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 whoop. Oh, my gun, it's empty. Oh, no. Oh, that one's not empty. There you go. But we choose up sides based on the might that somebody can bring to the battle. God does not choose that way. God chooses the weak. He chooses the poor. That which is not so attractive. Ain't that right, Eddie? <laughs> God chooses us because of our heart. Brethren, have that heart. Secondly, the method He chooses. I've already pointed out it's the heart. But God chooses us based on our belief, our heart's surrender to the gospel. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and verse 13, it says, God chose us before the creation. That's pretty profound. Like I said, He knew you when you were in your mama's womb. He's the one that knitted you together. God chose us before the creation unto salvation through sanctification of the Spirit Watch this. And by your belief of the truth, so that He called you by our gospel. Do you see the sequence there? He saw you from the creation, knew what you would be, set you apart because He knew you were going to do what? You were going to do what? Your heart was going to surrender to Him and to His will and to the truth. And seeing that as a result, so He called you. By our gospel. That is how He brought you into the family of God. In Acts chapter 13 and verse 48, Luke writes, The chosen were saved to eternal life through belief in the gospel. Again, he connects those two concepts. You got the invitation you got to come to Jesus because He knew you would believe given the opportunity. And indeed, you did. Well, let's wrap this up then. The outcome. He chose us not just simply to be His people, but He chose us with a plan and a work to do in mind. Back to where we began at earlier uh, in, in, in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. There it is. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9, He says, You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood. There were priestly duties He had in mind for you. You are a holy nation. He chose you for holiness. He didn't choose you to be happy. He chose you to be holy. He didn't choose you to attend church. He, told, he chose you to be a holy nation, a people for His own possession. And here it is. Here's the job. That you may show forth the excellencies of Him who called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. You were chosen with a task in mind, a plan and a destiny that you would show forth the excellencies of Him in your life every day. By your example, first of all, the example of life you're living, the character of life you're living. But also, you're showing forth the excellencies of Him by the things you're saying and doing. That you are in fact telling others about His excellence. That God has been so gracious and merciful to you. But then also Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 4. He chose us in Christ before He created the world. Again, this is not an afterthought with God. He chose you before He created the world. That, he, that you should be, or that we should be, holy and without blemish. There's your job, my friend. That's what He chose you to become. He didn't choose you to become a mama. He didn't choose you to become an engineer. He didn't choose you to become a pharmacist. He didn't choose you uh, to become a school teacher or a preacher. He chose you to become holy and without blemish before Him in love, having planned for us to be adopted as sons. It's so glorious that God loves us so much. For you see, the Lord does not look on the things that man looks at. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord, well, He looks at the heart, 1 Samuel 16 and verse 7. And so He picked us for a job. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and verse 18, and talking about you and I individually in the church, said that each one of us are like several parts of one body. And He says this concerning that body. God arranged the parts. Everybody say that together. God arranged the parts. Who did it? God arranged 
the parts. It was a part of God's plan. He brought you into the kingdom for a job, my friend. For a part, a role for you to play. Not unlike the parts of your human body. The hand has a specific role. And it ain't for walking. See, the hand is for pointing. The hand is for moving the clicker along. The hand is for that. Unless you're a gymnast like me and I walked on my hands all the time. But anyways, uh, when I was a teenager, not recently and I ain't doing it today. But anyways, uh, the different parts of our body have different functions. The eyeball doesn't have the same function as the foot, but it's got a job to do. And what's going on with you if your eye is not working? You're in trouble. Because the eye has a, cho- a job to do. So listen to what he says about this. He says, So God arranged the parts of the body as He chose, as it is. There are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you, nor the hand or the head to the feet, I don't need you. Instead, the parts of the body, this is so cool, listen now, the parts of the body that seem weaker are the more important parts. And the parts of the body that seem as less honorable, we make of greater value. Again, God can do incredible things with those weak and broken parts. And so let's look at a couple people as we conclude. The Apostle Paul was picked, picked for a job when God offered him the chance to become a Christian. In Acts chapter 9 and verse 15, in explaining to Ananias why he really did need to go teach, uh, go to Saul of Tarsus and show him Jesus and what Jesus could do, it says, Saul, I have chosen for what? An important work. He wasn't just chosen to become a child of God. He wasn't just chosen to show up for church. He was chosen for an important work. You, my friends, like Saul, are chosen for an important work. I want him to tell others, other nations, and their rulers, and the people of Israel about me. Chosen with a job in mind. And then, of course, in Acts 22 and verse 14, is uh, Ananias uh, is speaking to Saul, telling him why God is giving him the opportunity. This Christian killer, this man who made orphans out of Christian family children. Here's Ananias speaking to him. The God of our fathers chose you long ago to know His plan. He chose you to see the righteous one and to hear words from Him. You will be His witness to all people. You will tell them what you have seen and what you have heard. And that is the reason why. Throughout every one of his epistles, as Paul begins his writings in Galatians chapter 1, Ephesians chapter 1, Colossians chapter 1, in each of these, he speaks about me being an apostle chosen by Jesus Christ. An apostle of Jesus Christ. Paul had a job to do, and he did it. God called him to it. In Acts chapter 1 and verse 24, there was a guy by the name of Matthias. Judas had killed himself. And when they went about trying to figure out who was going to replace Judas, it says in verse 24, Lord, as they were drawing straws as to who was going to become the next apostle, Lord, you who know the hearts of all, show which one of these two you have chosen to take the place of Judas, is what it's referring to, his place as an apostle. And then they drew straws to choose the one of the two men to become an apostle. The draw showed that Matthias was the one that the Lord wanted, so he became an apostle. So they used this drawing of straws thing, okay? And there's no miraculous hocus-pocus to that. They were drawing straws. That's where the concept of drawing straws came from. It's from that event. And so they drew straws. But I'm telling you, who picked the straw? Who picked the straw? He says... You show us by the drawing of the straw which one you have chosen. And why were they confident that God could do that? Look at the beginning of the verse. Lord, you who know the hearts of all, you choose. And of course, it was the drawing of the straws that brought it to be, but it was still God that chose Matthias to be an apostle. It's amazing how God brings this to pass. In Jeremiah chapter 1, 
As God is trying to convince Jeremiah to go and do the work that he had chosen him to do, said these words to encourage him. Before I formed you in the womb. Isn't it amazing how the scriptures are so consistent? Who put Jeremiah in the womb? It was God. Who formed him in the womb? It was God. And he says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I chose you. You see this business of God looking at our hearts? He doesn't have to come into this auditorium and look in your heart to know what heart you have. He saw your heart before He made you. Because He is, after all, God. And He says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I chose you. And I appointed you to become a prophet to the nations. And someone says, so what, God is forcing him to do it? Not at all. What was it that God knew about Jeremiah if He gave him half a chance to be a prophet? What did God know Jeremiah would choose? That he would do it. Okay, God didn't force Jeremiah to become a prophet. He didn't force Matthias to become an apostle. He didn't force Saul of Tarsus to become the great apostle Paul. And He didn't force you to become a Christian or even to remain faithful. All of those things are our choices. But because God looks upon the heart, what does He know? He knows the choice you're going to make because He knows your heart. Hence the opportunity offered. And each of these, by God's love and grace and what God knew about their heart, were given that opportunity. Important, important jobs. I don't know what God chose you to do physically. I don't know what He chose you to do as a career. He chose me to be a fireman. And gave me that opportunity. I'm telling you, He threw that right in my lap. If you'd have asked me when I was 17 years old, you're going to become a fireman someday? I hadn't got that in my plans, no. But it fell in my lap. A police officer, not for me, but for some of you. A chef. A few of us have found the talent for being a chef. A nurse, a preacher, a teacher, a musician, a soldier, a mommy. I'm telling you, God has the ability to shape those things in your life give you those opportunities based on what He knows within your heart. Like a potter seeing a lump of clay that He can shape into the shape He wants it to be. So it might be a vessel that's useful to Him. So God works in the hearts of men. So here's where it ends. Paul says to you and I as lumps of clay. Bet you never thought about yourself being a lump of clay. You know, some of you look like a lump of clay, but, uh, but not many of you. But I don't know if we ever saw ourselves as a lump of clay in the hands of God. But before God, that's what He wants you to be. He wants you to be this lump of clay that He can shape into the man or woman of God that He plans for you to be in His kingdom. To function as your part in the body of Christ, as a hand or a foot or an eye or whatever the plan is that God placed you in the body to be. But apparently, Paul needed to make the argument you don't have the right to defy that choice. Who are you who argue against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, why did you make me this way? Or doesn't the potter have the right over the clay for the same lump to make one part for glory and another part for simple use? That's you and me, a lump of clay. So what are you going to do with yourself as a lump of clay? Here's what Paul pleaded with them to do in Romans chapter 12. I beg you, I beg you, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and well-pleasing to God, for this is the way to worship. And do not be conformed to this world. Don't let the world take the clay of your life and your heart and shape it the way it wants. But rather, he says, don't be conformed to this world, but be continually transformed by the renewing of your minds that you might determine what the will of the Lord, what the will of the Lord is. It is your hearts that He wants. So surrender, that's what He says. Offer everything. Offer Him your hearts. The psalmist said in Psalm 51, after he had done some terrible, terrible things, wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Friend, if you've never become a Christian, that's what you desperately need. You need to be washed thoroughly from your iniquities, cleansed of your sins. And the Bible says in Acts 22 and verse 16 that the way in which that happens 
is that you are baptized into Christ. And so doing, you wash away your sins as you call in the name of the Lord. I encourage you to do that this morning. And if you are a child of God and you have broken God's heart as David did when he wrote this or prior to writing this psalm, then plead this to God. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me as we stand and as we sing. Sir. Fresh shepherds. Yes. 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 Well, there you go. No, no, no. No, you want me to do it? Okay. Okay. Just for a second, have a seat. Just for a second. Chris, where are you sitting at? Chris Ship. There you are. There you are. I want you to stand up. That's why I had everybody else sit down. Chris Shiflett was baptized into Christ just, uh, now what, it was about a week ago, wasn't it? Two weeks ago? Anyways, brother, it is so great to have you welcomed into the family of God here. I look forward to the service we're going to do together. God has called you to a work. You and I need to find out what that work is and you can get busy on it. And God bless you, brother. Have a seat. You know, I worked really hard on trying to figure out who I was going to shoot with that squirt gun. I thought about BK for a minute. Well, more like about three seconds. Uh, thought about Terry Don. I, I glanced over at David. I really wanted to shoot Eddie, but anyways. I just decided I would pick the smallest guy in the room, and so I, Michael got the whole load. But anyways, I am grateful for your presence today. Isn't it good to be together and worship God? Amen. Do you, do, you're hungry? Yeah, okay, I'll shut up. <laughs> I'm glad you said that, though I need to remind everybody, there is food prepared, it's in the fellowship hall, and if you'll let me get there first, I'll get the first bite, but uh, we're going to have a prayer and end this thing, and, and then we'll, we'll go at it. Okay, I'm done. Should I shut up? Be quiet. <laughs> Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, again we come to thee in prayer, thanking thee for this large day and what it means to us as Christians. We're thankful, Father, for this great country li we live in and all the many freedoms we enjoy. We're thankful, Father, for our farmers and ranchers who supply food on our table and our abundant supply of food that we enjoy in this country. We pray, Father, that you send some much needed and morning rainfall to this area and cooler temperatures would be better too, Father. We're thankful, Father, for this congregation that meets here in Grosbeck. We're thankful for our church family. We pray that each one of us will benefit from this lesson this morning that will help us uh, live a better Christian life. We're thankful, Father, for our visitors from Nigeria. We pray that they're successful in all the efforts they do, and we pray that you'll give them a long life in our service. Once again, we pray for all the sick of this number this morning. We pray if it be thy will, they return to their normal health. We're again ask that you 
uh, forgive us of our sins when we fail you. We once again thank thee for thy son who you sent to earth to die that we might have a hope of eternal life. We ask all of these things in Christ's name. Amen.